Now, I'd like to take a moment to introduce Professor Rima Hanna, our, our moderator for today's panel. Rima Hanna is the Jeffrey Chea Professor of Southeast Asia Studies and the Chair of the International Development Area at the Harvard Kennedy School. She serves as the Faculty Director of Evidence for Policy Design at Harvard University's Center for International Development. Her research revolves around improving the provision of public services in developing, sorry, and emerging nations, particularly for the very poor. She is interested in examining how governments can improve and strengthen social protection, tax collection, and environmental safety. Rima is the faculty chair of the leading smart policy design executive education program happening this September. Rima, thank you so much for organizing this important discussion and over to you. No, thank you so much, Erica. I am so, so excited to see so many people turning out for today's session. Thank you so much for being here. We are so excited for today's panel. We have three really terrific speakers and hope to have an engaging discussion around how you and your organization can better harness data and evidence. So today I'm gonna to focus the discussion on making data-driven de decisions about how to allocate scarce resources in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. And, and I wanna tell you in advance, thanks so much. We got over 60 really amazing questions in advance for the panel. And so we curated them and we chose uh, a few of them to, to focus our discussion today. And so thank you so much for participating and helping shape the discussion we're having here today. Uh, before I like begin, I'd like to introduce our speakers. So first we have Matt Andrews. Matt is the senior lecturer in public policy at HKS and the director of the Center for International Development's Building State Capabilities Program. His research focuses on public sector reform, particularly budgeting and financial management reform and participatory governance in developing and transitional governments. And we're so excited to have you here. Thank you, Matt, for being here today. Second, we have Karen Dynan. Karen is a professor of the practice of economics and the former assistant secretary for economic policy and the chief economist at the US Department of the Treasury. Before that, Karen worked at the Federal Reserve Board for 17 years, working on macroeconomic forecasting, household finances, and the Fed's response to the uh, uh, 2008 financial crisis. She was a senior economist on the Council of Economic Advisors from 2003 to 2004. So thank you as well, Karen, for being here today. Last uh, but not least, we are very lucky to have with us Asam Kwaja, our very own director of the Center for International Development here at the Kennedy School and the professor of international finance and development. Asam helped co-found uh, the Center for Economic Research in Pakistan, CERF, um, and his research ranges from understanding market fa failures in emerging financial markets to examining the private education market in low-income countries. So thank you all for being here today. Um, I'm really excited. I know there was a great deal of enthusiasm uh, for the panelists, as I said, both in terms of the questions, and I see we're, al oh, we're almost at 400 participants. So this is just really amazing that everybody's um, here today and to really have this, what I think is a very important discussion. Okay, so I'm gonna start by posing the same question to all the panelists. I'm gonna start with you, Asim. I'd like you to share a bit about how you think about inclusive growth as countries start to really think about rebuilding from the COVID crisis. I see you start with the easy question, Reva. Uh, it's a great question. First of all, thank you uh, for, for inviting me to be on the panel. It's a pleasure, I'm excited. I, 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 I love teaching. Uh, in the course, I, I love the idea of kind of using evidence for decision making. That's pretty much, I think, what the Kennedy School's deep mission in life is. And so it, it, this is very appropriate. I should also say COVID uh, puts a, a special emphasis uh, on, on, on this uh, mission, if you will. Um, so let me let me start from um, pretty much a, a, a sort of personal research experience all the way up to what I think uh, as centers at Harvard and other places we should be doing. From a personal research experience, I've been very involved in kind of um, some of the health side COVID response in Pakistan. Many of us, in fact, all of us in the panel have been in one way or the other um, involved in it. Um, one of the things which struck me very early on, um, and I think this was both the kind of good news and I guess the, the challenging news, was how critical in this crisis the need for data was, the need for evidence was in our response. Um, 
And in two ways. Uh, one is the obvious way, which is we're all obsessed with prevalence rates and correctly so, because, you know, uh, the trade off on when you can open or not open or how you can open or how are we, like, is it safe to go outside or not? You know, you know, we must study, you study the environment. And I know after, after hanging out with you, I started looking at like the pollution index before going out. Uh, uh, but, but this idea of sort of thinking about in policy, how critical COVID prevalence rates were and how to measure them and what's an appropriate measurement. I was fascinated to see not only the need for that amongst kind of decision makers and researchers, uh, but also amongst the public. Uh, and, and I think there is an opportunity because of that uh, to start saying data can be really powerful in decision making and should be used. Uh, and it's not just getting data, it's beginning to realize what's good data, what's not good data, how does data evolve, what can we do to change prevalence rates. So that was a very important set of discussion uh, items that at least when I started talking to my counterparts in, in the health departments, it was very clear. Um, I think, you know, once one thinks of of, of data. Um, the second question that comes with it is sort of this idea of how can data start giving you a much more nuanced picture of the world? And I'm going to refer Rima back to what you told me very early on from the stuff you were doing. And I hope we have a chance to hear from you as well about the Indonesian crisis or the situation in Indonesia, which is, you know, when you think of inclusion, a shock like COVID may affect people in very unexpected ways. And so you may have preconceived notions on who's hurt or who's, who's, who's uh, more safe from this situation, but they may not fall along the actual lines of what happens. So you might think the poor or the, or the vulnerable are going to be in rural areas. And what I understand Rima, from your work, and I've seen that in other places, that may not have been the case in many countries. The vulnerable may have been non-traditional vulnerable people. People lost jobs in sectors we hadn't necessarily thought of as sectors would get affected in a normal recession or something. And so suddenly this question of inclusion in COVID and the importance of data becomes really powerful because who is being excluded may change very drastically in crisis. And so for me, this became really a, a powerful calling to say, look, if we're gonna deal with this seriously, as much as there is a pandemic, there also is an infodemic, and this is a word people have used. Um, and that infodemic is gonna be critical for us to get help in, in real time for people who really need it. And that's my sense of inclusion, at least in this crisis. That's the immediate sense of inclusion. And then there's a longer term sense of inclusion and exclusion, which is as the economy tries to kind of uh, limp back up or struggle back up, there is a question again of using information and data and figuring out which sectors are, 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 are rebounding well and which sectors are not. And perhaps even more importantly, which sectors have the potential to pivot to an even better outcome than we had before. And that's something, and I'll end with kind of how we're thinking about this at, at the center level, at, at CID's level, which is we are beginning to put together a proposal and several of you are aware of it, and we'll share more details later on, kind of thinking beyond COVID, uh, uh, thinking about the next five years of recovery and thinking about what are powerful pivot moments so that not only do we recover uh, from what has been really a, a, a global ailment, but also in the lessons we've learned from this pandemic, those lessons allow us to perhaps, and maybe this is optimistic thinking, but I, I think we should think there's hope is very important in these times as well, is perhaps we can do better than we were doing before. Perhaps we can reimagine how to teach. Perhaps we can reimagine how to do health delivery. Perhaps we can reimagine um, how to do social service delivery better using kind of the lessons from COVID, which is data, information, technology, and extracting intelligence from data. So that's kind of, I'd end with that. Uh, but that's, I think, why this particular thing that we're discussing today and, and the lessons that we teach in, 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 our, in our courses are especially relevant uh, now and in the years to come. No, thank you, Asim. I must say I've been um, you know, very impressed seeing a lot of different countries and the way that they use data, both traditional forms of data, newer forms of administrative data, but also coming up with methodologies to get more soft information and data in the economy as well to figure out who are these newly vulnerable. And you know, this is something that, you know, unfortunately, we'll talk a little today. I'm hoping that we'll talk also more about in the course in the fall as well. But I'd like to turn it over to Matt um, and ask you the same question about how you think about inclusive growth as countries are starting to rebuild from the COVID crisis. Thanks, thanks, Gemma. Um, yeah, I, I always like these sessions to hear what my colleagues are saying about such dynamic things. Um, 
You know, I think uh, I'll, I'll speak a little bit about what I'm seeing and, and experiencing in terms of both the substance and the process of kind of what you might call inclusive growth. The first thing that I'm hearing from people is um, a, a focus on what kinds of data do we need to be looking at and what kinds of focal points do we need to have in our policies. And I'm talking mostly about people in developing countries, emerging countries, and, and oftentimes countries that have seen a lot of economic growth in the last decade or so. They, they haven't, you know, they've actually been countries where we've said, gee, they've grown really well. And then COVID hits and they start to see a bunch of vulnerabilities. And a lot of them are kind of trying to say, are, are starting to focus on jobs. And beforehand, it's not that they didn't focus on jobs, but they focused on some kind of aggregate measure of employment creation. How many jobs do we have? Now they're starting to ask a lot of questions about whose jobs, where, and what are the conditions of service? What, what, uh, how, how, what do those jobs look like? Not just kind of what do they pay, but I think that people are focusing on that more before as well. But kind of what kinds of social protections are available to people because of the, the employment that they have? And possibly even more than that, what, what are the conditions under which they work? And, um, and, and, and what have we learned about the importance of the conditions of work uh, in this COVID period, right? Where some people have just been more vulnerable on the job, in the job than other people. And actually, in many developing countries, a lot of the jobs that have been created uh, over the last few decades have, have been jobs that have actually led to a lot of vulnerability on the job, right? And, and where you don't have major social protection, you don't give people many options. Um, and I'm hearing now a lot of people in these countries saying, okay, we've had growth. We created jobs, but now we're very, very concerned about who didn't get the jobs, about um, about what kinds of jobs are created, about just what that means for folks. So the kinds of things that you know are coming up for me a lot are um, things like youth unemployment. Right. In a lot of countries, I think jobs were being created, but there's this kind of youth unemployment problem that was sitting in the back of people's heads, and people were saying, "Yes, it's a problem, but we are on aggregate doing better." And now they're saying, well, you know what? We have this huge group. We really need to focus on it. I think the gender aspect into, to, to do with jobs is coming up in a lot of conversations I have where people are saying, we have been creating jobs for women, but they aren't great jobs. And, 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 and now those jobs with, with COVID have just made them very vulnerable. So to me, I think that's a very, very interesting and I think a very important pivot that I, I think is probably one that, that um, is a good pivot for us working on growth issues because inclusivity is not just about, well, everybody you know, has a chance of getting a job, what job, where, um, and with what kind of power or what kind of, kind of uh, authority and, and, and social voice. I think the second thing that I'm seeing is related to what I would call the kind of process of pursuing inclusive growth. And, and, and I'm hearing a lot of people saying um, to me things like, you know, we need more people in those conversations. We need to find those, those, those groups that are more vulnerable and they need to be at the table, right? Again, I think, you know, you talk, we're talking with countries that have been quite successful and they start to realize, look, we were successful, but we were really talking to the people who had capital, to the people who had education. These were the people who were kind of crafting our processes and our policies and there were a lot of voices that we weren't listening to. And, and those people didn't just need a job. They need, needed other things too. And in the next uh, um, growth strategy, we need to be focused on those other things as well. And I think here is a very interesting, you mentioned the word kind of soft data. We're finding this is, I think, almost the def definition of it, right? There's a lot of understanding of preferences, of people's, um, uh, 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 people's lifestyles, people's realities, that we haven't worked out how to get that into hard data sets yet. And what this means is it means developing strategies whereby we engage with people in real time and we listen to them. And we work out how to take what we hear and turn that into data that we can act on so that it's not just a series of anecdotes, but it's actually meaningful information that we can put into policy. And I think that that's been a very interesting thing for me to hear from a lot of folks that we've worked on where they're kind of saying, you know, we can't just rest on the data sets we have. We need to in real time go out and capture this kind of soft data. And I think that that also is um, a great lesson coming out of this about the importance of, of real-time listening, but then working out what do we do with what we hear.
No, so I completely agree with you, Matt, on a number of fronts. I mean, for example, I think one of the things that really struck me as people were thinking about data collection during the COVID crisis was not just whether or not you had a job, but what were the conditions of the job and how you felt about the conditions. And it was so interesting because you were trying to collect this data often electronically. Um, and it was such a challenge because we normally do this in interviews and thinking about how you take those kind of questions and put them into harder surveys and try to collect this kind of information on preferences information on conditions that's so important in thinking about the market. I also note, I think for me also, it struck me at your conversation about jobs is that, you know, in the US, this conversation about the, the labor markets changing and in regard to automation has been part of the public debate for a while. And I think for me, what COVID also, why it focused a, a newer discussion and an even further discussion on jobs and jobs and the kind of skills you need for future jobs is that automation got a big push forward that, that digital world got a big push forward in the developing world. And I think these are conversations we really need to be having right now. Um, but on that note, I'm gonna uh, turn it over to Karen um, and ask you the same question um, about your views about inclusive growth as countries start to think about the COVID crisis. Um, sure, um, thank you for inviting me. It's great to be here. Uh, and it's great to hear what the other uh, panelists are saying about this topic. Um, it's super important. Um, I guess I'll, I'll compliment what Matt said uh, at the beginning of his remarks about kind of our starting point in terms of, he talked about lower income countries. I'll talk about higher income countries. They were really facing um, two challenges going into the pandemic. They were facing um, kind of sluggish overall growth and they were facing uh, rising inequality. And um, that's, I wanted to mention that because then, uh, you know, you ask, well, well what happened, what's, what's going to be the result of the pandemic? And I think um, with overall growth, it's, it's probably unclear at this point. Uh, certainly we are all familiar with um, kind of these, you know, big step forwards in terms of productivity enhancements having to do with remote uh, work. Um, but on the other hand, um, uh, you know, there are, there are also going to be issues that countries face, uh, kind of frictions getting their economy started again, that may put a damper on overall growth. Um, so, so I think it's unclear where they're going to, you know, where growth is going to land coming out of the pandemic. Um, in terms of inequality, I, I am quite worried that the pandemic is going to exacerbate um, inequality, not just in higher income countries, but uh, in lower income countries as well. Uh, we saw job losses disproportionately concentrated in the services sector. That's not surprising because that's kind of the high contact, high social contact economic activity. And that's where a lot of lower wage workers are. And what we're seeing in countries that are um, where a lot of people are getting vaccinated is we're seeing um, kind of a lot of demand in the sec service sector uh, suddenly as, as the economies are opening up and everybody's got job postings for workers that don't require a lot of education. Uh, so they should be helping this group. But on the other hand, I think we need to appreciate the fact we have uh, kind of just tens of millions of workers around the world that need to find jobs. And I, I don't think, I think we'll see a lot of them hired in coming months as, uh, for example, in the United States where our recovery is really kicking into higher gears with other countries to follow as people are vaccinated. Uh, but I don't think we should take it for granted that they're all gonna get back to work because as you were saying, Rima, uh, automation took a step forward. I also just think we're gonna see businesses uh, emerging kind of leaner uh, from the pandemic, so not needing as many workers. So I think it's going to take a while to get all these workers back to work, which then raises questions about kind of an ongoing, what we would call a K-shaped recovery. Um, so what, what does this all mean for, for policy and where does data come in? Uh, so my colleagues talked a lot about data for tracking purposes, totally agree with all that, and would love to come back and talk more about that. Um, but I want to talk about um, kind of if, if you're a policymaker and you're thinking about, well, well, what needs to be done at this point? I mean, different countries have done different things depending on kind of their abilities to, to borrow and finance spending to replace income. Um, but going forward, I think all countries need to be focused on basically investments that will both get money out into the economy, but also um, lead to growth and inclusive growth over the longer run. And, and here's where data came in comes in, uh, you know, we really had kind of a, a revolution in the years 
leading up to the crisis, uh, where we, we had all this kind of literature that um, kind of rigorously documented using data that there doesn't have to be a trade-off between um, growth and inequality, that in fact, you can uh, basically, uh, you know, spend money on social programs that basically uh, serves to um, act as investments in people. Uh, you know, if you spend money on poor children and their their parents, you know, if you spend money on education, if you spend money on their health, on their housing, uh, you know, it's, it, it, whether it's poor countries or rich countries, uh, what we were seeing in the data was we were seeing not just the fact we were helping uh, people in the short run, we were leaving hardship in the short run, but 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 uh, using kind of big administrative data sets, we were seeing kind of effects that were lasting, uh, you know, for children all the way into adulthood, uh, basically kind of raising their ability to engage with the labor force and and be higher wage workers. Uh, so it's so it's a payoff both for them and it's a payoff for the economy as a whole, and that's that's important because whether you're a rich country or a poor country right now, you're probably feeling a little bit of fiscal uh, constraint here. You got to use your money super widely, um, but also kind of as the pandemic starts to fade, we're going to be back to kind of the old political arguments about like, you know, what do we do? And I just think this, this concrete, rigorous evidence-based policy is something that can sell uh, to, to across a wide political spectrum. No, that's great. And I agree completely. One of the uh, things we hope to cover in the course is we know a lot of countries are budget constrained. We know a lot of countries want to make investments, both in ensuring, you know, reducing poverty and inequality today, thinking about future growth and all, you know, thinking about making a more level playing field for the next generation. And so the topics we hope to cover are such, such as, you know, how do we set up more adaptive and flexible social protection systems, which the COVID crisis, you know, taught us we really need, particularly, you know, hopefully we won't have a crisis this large again, but particularly in bad economic times. Um, we'll cover some of the topics around jobs and active labor market policy. You know, we know that traditional training programs that many countries do around the world often don't deliver the kind of results we want. So we'll try to brainstorm and think about different ideas and how to be more creative. What the evidence and data tells us about what we can try to do to start thinking about creating you know, more skilled workforce and trying to give people more opportunities. Um, Okay, but I, I want to cut my you know commentary short because I think we've got um, very limited time and I had so many questions because you guys wrote in so many wonderful questions. So what I'm going to do is and you know try to keep the answers shorter so that we can try to get through a bunch. I'm going to start with Matt um, and ask you about your thoughts about the type of leadership that's really needed for the types of challenges that we're 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 facing in the wake of this COVID-19 crisis and thinking about the recovery. Thanks, Rima. And I'll also, I'll also reflect on kind of leadership and, and, and evidence as well, because I think that that's something that is kind of a, a theme we're trying to develop. Um, you know, to me, oftentimes when I speak to people, they'll speak about kind of, you know, we need leadership as if leadership is always the same and there's one type of it. I think one of the odd things that I'd say is that, you, you know, especially when we think about public policy, to me, one of the observations we've made probably over the last 10 to 15 years has, very be, has been very much that there are different types of leadership. Um, and, and the type of leadership depends on many different variables. So one of them is the nature of the challenge that you face. And some challenges that you face are, are challenges that are well known and your, your people have been through them before. And you as the leader essentially need to... Um, use evidence to define what a pathway out of them looks like. You know, I often think leadership is about showing, you know, what is the destination, what is the pathway, and then what is the mobilization. And, you know, if we know where we're going, we need to say to people, here's where we want to go to, here's what the pathway looks like, and here's how I'm going to organize you. And now you just need to follow. And then we use evidence well, we use evidence firstly to frame all of those things. And then we use evidence to evaluate that we're on the path, right? Are you hitting the milestones? Are you getting there? And, and so it's, it's evidence becomes very important. But this is very much kind of almost like leadership in a kind of a project management -y way, right? Now, in the public policy realm, a lot of leadership looks like this. And, and, and it's because it, 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 public organizations tend to do a lot of things that they've done before. 
And it's partly because of the way that we create budgets and the, you know, the way we create bureaucracies. And, you know, we've done things like this before. And so we just keep doing them. Um, and, and this kind of leadership is really, really important. And when we're going into the pandemic and through the pandemic, there are some types of leadership that look just like this, right? You know, uh, getting the vaccine out looks like this. It's logistic, right? It's, you know, we do know how to do these things. We know how to kind of do kind of mass vaccination, targeted vaccination, et cetera. As soon as the challenge is to identify kind of, you know, what types of vaccination are we doing? And I think at least in, in, in the US at one stage, it was like, let's just do all of the above, right? We're going to do it through pharmacies. We're going to do it at mass vaccination sites. We're going to bring out the military and we're going to do it through local doctors. I say, that's great. We know how to do those things. And then we can just follow the evidence. And some of that leadership is required here. The other type of leadership, though, is when you're dealing with ambiguity and you're dealing with new things and where you're dealing with novelty and the novelty is, is, is in contested territory. So, you know, here you're kind of facing a challenge that we haven't faced before. You know, when, when COVID hit, it's called the novel coronavirus. People forgot that first term and it's so important. And they kept on saying, you know, but one week Dr. Fauci says no masks. Then he says masks. Why are you being so confusing? Well, because it's ambiguous, right? And what we need in ambiguity is leadership that can, that can still be evidence-based, but evidence-based within ambiguity, where you're not saying we're looking for the answer today, we're looking to learn. And it's evidence-based learning-oriented leadership, right? So we have an idea of where we want to go to, but we only have an idea. We have a direction. We want to get out of this mess, right? We want to get out of here. We, we have ideas about pathways, but we've never seen this before. So we don't know the milestones. We don't know exactly what it is. But we, our job is to think as hard as possible and look for as many lessons in the past as possible to identify what those pathways might be and to identify multiple pathways so that we experiment, right? And then our mobilization is the thing that's hardest because our mobilization is to say to our followers, whether they be our employees or our citizens, this, we don't have the answer, but here are our ideas. We're working very hard. We're bringing as much evidence to bear as possible. And what we need you to do is we need you to become an agent of change with us. And we need you to inhabit that ambiguity and to be creative and not just to demand answers, but to become part of that process. And that's a very different kind of leadership. And I think what's been very hard is that you need both, not one or the other. And so leaders have had to move from one to the other all the time. And I think that that's been, you know, to me, to, in my mind, we've had two problems. The one is that many leaders have been very uncomfortable inhabiting that second type of leadership, that learning oriented, ambiguous leadership where you as the leader are almost being vulnerable and saying, we don't have the solution, but we have ideas and we may we may need to change the course as we go along. And I think a lot of leaders in the public space don't like that at all. So they inhabit too much of the certainty. But the problem is that when you're certain and then you're wrong, and then you're certain and then you're wrong, and then you're certain and then you're wrong, it undermines the certainty. And I think that we've seen that in quite a few countries. I think that where leaders have then accepted both of those types of leadership, they struggle to move back and forth in the right way. And I think that it's confused people. And I don't want to suggest that it's easy to do, but I think that it's tremendously important to recognize that those are those two, two models. And again, it's, it's two different ways of thinking about evidence. It's two different ways of deploying evidence. I often say to people, the one is, you know, we often hear people follow, saying, follow the science, right? And it's like, but in one, in, in one of those models, it's follow the science that we know. And on the other, it's follow the scientific process right? And the scientific process is a process of finding and learning. And leaders need to understand that in these types of situations, they need to be able to speak both languages. And that's just been very difficult. No, I completely agree with you, Matt. It's, it's, it's hard because people think data, they think numbers, they think certainty. Whereas oftentimes there's a lot of decisions where the data is not going to tell you the right answer because there is no right answer. But rather, the data helps you frame the trade-off. There's pros and cons of every type of decision you make, and you want to make trade-offs based on, you know, and there it's going to come back to your the citizen beliefs, your, you know, your, in the politics of it, what you can and can't get through. And, you know, and there, 
this is where sometimes people feel frustrated. I feel like from the data and leaders feel frustrated from the data because they want that certainty. And so I think trying to be more comfortable with using the data to have a debate, um, to try to get at different things to try rather than just use data to say, this is what we're gonna do and not change course is something that I think is very difficult for people, but I think is something very important as we wanna try to have a more sort of um, evidence-based policy that's more evolving also as conditions on the ground are changing. Okay, I'm gonna change topics here for a second, uh, but close. Um, there was a very controversial question that was asked, um, uh, um, directed towards us. I'm gonna ask it because we don't shy away from controversial questions. But this was a, really a question about culture and data. Um, and that whether or not this data-driven and evidence approaches are you know, uh, better uh, suited for certain types of cultures, uh, certain types of citizens' beliefs about what is acceptable uh, versus other. And so the question is, uh, one of our participants asked is, you know, do we think that a lot of Eastern countries are you know, better suited for data-driven policies? And so, um, you know, uh, for example, they pointed to a lot of um, you know, credit rate, uh, credit ratings um, in China, um, is some of the data that's being uh, used in, in other ways in, in a lot of Eastern countries, um, you know, for example, the Adhar in India. Um, but then, um, and then this idea that, you know, it, when we think about sort of the Western perspective on data and data privacy and, and where do you draw the line and how do we think about these things more broadly when we think about the ethical considerations. And so I wanted to direct this to you, Asim. Great, thank you. I, I appreciate getting all the <laughs> tricky ones. Um, look, this is a great question, uh, but let me let me first start off by saying I, I'm noticing the chat and there are lots of concerns about data quality. And uh, I want to say something very, very clearly. And, and I, you know, I, I don't necessarily like making kind of strong statements, but I want to make this very strongly. I have never in my life been any ever in a situation where data does not speak. I don't think any one of us. So, so this idea that we shouldn't touch data because data is one of those beautiful things that the more you use it, the better it gets. There are very few products in the world like that. Most products, when you use them, you consume them, they deplete. Data actually gets better and better with usage. So please, all of you out there, never shy away from just digging into the data. That doesn't mean it's good, it's clean, it's not systematically biased. Of course, all those things are there. That's why we have fields called statistics and econometrics. Otherwise, you know, half my colleagues would be out of a job. So, so embrace data, love data, dream data, breathe data. It's just don't shy away from it. It's like the first time you sit an iPad and you're like 70 years old, no offense to the older generation. Don't be scared from touching all the buttons. Eventually you'll figure it out. It won't blow up in your face. Okay, so think of data like that. So I wanted to kind of start up with that. Now that said, there's some real issues in using data. And there are two types of issues. One is quality. And I think with quality, it's just a question. We have techniques to figure out whether the data is biased, it's noisy. You know, random errors in the data are not a problem. There's something called the law of large numbers, which some brilliant mathematicians wrote, which say if you add average a lot of noise, you get rid of noise. That is not the problem. The problem is systematic biases, systematic underreporting. But even that, trust me, is hard to systematically hide. The way to, to figure that out is you just put different data sets together. Not only does data get beautiful when you use it, when the data is like two great friends when they meet, they can have a real amazing party together. If you can get two different data sets meeting together and talking to each other, amazing things happen. They start revealing truths about each other. Um, and so, so again, that's the data accuracy side. Data privacy is a very different uh, set of questions and a very important set of questions. Uh, why do we care about data privacy? Look, there's a whole ethical discussion in data privacy. I'm not actually going to touch that even. I'm going to play, play a pure statistical thing. Why do I, as a statistician, as someone who loves data and who craves data, cares deeply about data privacy? I care deeply about data privacy because you don't get it right. Data will stop speaking well to you. If people are afraid that their data is going to be used against them, they will stop creating the right data trails that we can use to help them, right? So, so let me give you a very tangible example. People said, look, give you have practical examples of this. We were trying to get data on COVID preference. I'm going to give you a very mundane example, but this is about privacy and why it's so important. We were trying to get data on COVID preference. Now, there's something in statistics called a representative random sample. If you want to know what the average prevalence rate in a population is, you should randomly test people and see whether they're positive or negative, okay? However, if you approach people, and this is something all of us surveyors are obsessed about, 
which is refusal rates. Not just what is the attrition rate in a survey, but who is refusing. If you create a situation, which many countries did, that being COVID positive is a bad thing, not just for your health, which it clearly is, but bad because it's like a taboo thing. It's like when HIV testing first started, we were, there were taboos or social stigmas against being positive. If you create social stigmas, and I said, I, I can give you thousands of examples of countries and policies which basically created that environment. You would be immediately caught by the police. You'd be taken to a quarantine facility. You know, villagers would be afraid that you're COVID positive and want you to get out of their village because you can infect people. If you create that situation, people who are more likely to be COVID positive will refuse that test, will refuse to be surveyed. So you're systematically biasing data. If you can protect people's privacy, if you can tell them that by giving their data, their lives will be better, which means both protecting their privacy, but also using the data for their benefit, data flows will get so much better. In fact, I dream of a world, look, all of us spend, I can't tell you how many hours I've wasted and I apologize for all the project beneficiaries on doing long surveys, two hour long surveys every six months, asking how much dal and rice and meat you ate last week, right? That way of doing surveys was really powerful. And in fact, the big wave of surveys and data started with that. I think we're potentially in a new era where we no longer need to do that if we can use administrative data, um, data generated not for the reasons you thought, the cell phone calls you make, the social media presences you have, um, uh, the, the access to uh, financial bank accounts, your, your deposit behavior. There's a whole bunch of behavior. Financial markets are a great example of of that, where by our actions, we're revealing what we care about, what we do. I really believe a world where once that data source protected in terms of privacy becomes available. A lot of us researchers, we no longer need to rely on these painful two hour long interludes in your life and actually use that data. It's actually more accurate data. It's real time and it's cheap because it's already being collected. Uh, so we just need to set up the right, uh, but I don't want to trivialize the issue. This is a huge issue. I'm really worried by FinTech companies. I, I, I have done, played around with FinTech as well. If we abuse data, in the long term, we will lose out. There's also a big debate with the large data gatherers. There's a question at some stage about private companies and how, how we can get them to help. I do think there we need to be very careful. Um, there is a political economy over here, which is beyond my pay grade. My personal view is data ownership should ultimately lie with the individual who's generating that data. Even if others may be able to use it, that person for sure should be able to use, deploy, and share their data as they choose. And we should educate them when and where sharing their data is valuable for them or a contribution they're making to society. Let me just stop. No, thank you, Asim. I, you know, these are really hard discussions. And for me, I feel like a lot of the a lot of the debates and a lot of the regulations we have in place to protect data to privacy are about the kind of the older data you talked about. It's about survey data, collecting newer data, and it's not necessarily kept up with the fact that this new sources of administrative data are becoming available, especially with a lot of digitization. And so I think these discussions are ones we have to continue to have. Because I agree with you, I think that the administrative data is going to be very powerful in the future. Um, but we want to make sure that it doesn't, one, that people feel protected and safe, but it two, doesn't cause distortions in how people interact with the state, how they interact with companies and, and so forth. Um, but I want to kind of pivot towards the next question to Karen. We've talked a lot about data and the power for description. I think the question towards Karen that I think our participants really wanted to know about was this idea about the predictive nature of data. And in particular, during the crisis, you know, everybody started talking about the macro models. You know, it, um, you know, this was something that was an esoteric thing that people at feds and central banks around the world would spend a lot of their time thinking about predicting growth um, and predicting where our economy is heading and thinking about you know, where unemployment is going to be in the future. But suddenly everyone on the street, we were all obsessed reading about the newspapers. Which model is right? Where are we heading? Trying to think about... Um, um, you know, especially in these very uncertain times, you, as you know, as Matt also noted as well, you want some certainty of where we're going to come out of it at some point. And so I think the question um, people had is, you know, we've seen that these macro models, sometimes they predict well, sometimes they don't do well on prediction. Do we need to rethink the way we think about predicting different factors in the economy? And how do you think about that? 
Sure, um, that's a really interesting question. Uh, and I feel like this has been my life for uh, 15 months now talking about all of this. Um, let me, I, I wanna say two things. And what, one's about using uh, data to basically track what's going on in the economy. Uh, and the other is about kind of the more formal mo modeling uh, process. But I wanna do the first one because it really relates to what Asim and Matt were saying. Um, we had, um, you know, as, as countries were uh, kind of struggling to figure out kind of what sorts of policies to deploy, we had like incredible innovation in terms of, of, of data. And, you know, the, the issue was we just couldn't wait on the standard government indicators to figure out, for example, last March, you know, we want to deploy fiscal policy to fill, fill this hole we see coming in the economy, but who knows how big that hole is going to be. And we can't wait until sometime in May to find out what's going to go on with jobs in April uh, to fill that hole. We want to get the policy in place in, in March and April. Um, and so we saw all sorts of like lots of just incredible creativity. Some of it was along the lines of just new surveys that were put out in the field. Um, others was kind of combining indicators in an econometric way to sort of do a real time tracking of, of what's going on with economic activity. But the third was using these big administrative data sets that you all have been talking about. And I should say, um, good and bad there. I mean, we learned so much more than we otherwise would have known by looking at, for example, you know, credit card transactions or small business payroll data on what was going on in the economy in roughly real time. And this stuff comes out, you know, within a week of kind of when it's the period it corresponds to, which is terrific. But and I think this relates to the data quality issues that are coming uh, that are that are coming up. I mean. This, these indicators, they can't be just used on an unfiltered basis. Um, they are imperfect um, uh, in ways such that, um, you know, we would get some of them pointing in different directions. So there's been a big debate, for example, in the United States about just how kind of comfortable kind of lower income households have been, how much hardship have we relieved with all of this fiscal policy uh, that has really had policy implications and the issue has been that some of these big data indicators are saying low income households are doing just fine, but others and, and you know, our own eyes are seeing like long lines at food banks and whatnot. Um, and I think, I think the issue here is that none of this data is wrong. I'm with awesome that this data is wonderful, it's beautiful, but you know, you need to be wise when you're interpreting it. So for example, if you're looking at kind of uh, bank account data from a major bank and you're saying, oh, well, look at those people at the bottom of our sample. They, they have more in their accounts than they did a year ago. Well, that's, that's right for this group of people. But remember, what about all the unbanked people? Those are the people who are, uh, we're, that we're worried about most and they're just not even captured in the sample. So I think the data is very useful, but I also just think you as the user have to understand, is this the sample I want to capture? Is this the you know, the concept, you know, credit card spending is by no means, you know, all of consumption. So I just think it takes um, kind of some, uh, you know, training to be able to kind of use this data right. Uh, and if you don't have that, then you might add to noise and you might add to the biases that are already out there. Um, so on the question of the formal modeling, absolutely right, Nima, this was a period um, it actually reminded me of my experience trying to forecast the economy during the Great Recession. Unusual period uh, in terms of dynamics in the economy and uh, you, the standard models just didn't do their, the jobs we wanted them to do. And that's not surprising because those standard models are based off of historical relationships <laughs> and they're based off the things that have been important in terms of driving economic dynamics uh, over history. And uh, it's not surprising at all then that they don't kind of capture kind of what's going on in an unusual period. And in particular in a period where uh, kind of 
uh, forces are coming into play that we haven't had to deal with historically? I think the answer there, and, and this gets at something that, that Matt was saying, was just that we need to a adapt. I mean, economists like leaders just need to recognize that, you know, one model based on kind of a certain set of circumstances isn't going to be kind of the model that's going to be informative. Uh, and you need to kind of have a, a stable of models and you need to be nimble and you need to keep kind of working in kind of new variables over time. I mean, with the financial crisis, for example, we saw lots of innovation in terms of working in more financial linkages in the model. And I think with the pandemic, you know, what we have seen as economists having to work in kind of new forces and new dynamics. Oh, that's great. And I think you're raising a number of points. First, we all need to think outside the box and to be open to thinking about things differently than we've done before, especially when we're reacting to new crises, to new, to new issues in the world. I think you also raise a point and it, you know, it connects to what everybody's been talking about. The data is just not in a vacuum that you go and you look at the data and it tells you stuff. That one of the things we want to think about in the course, and in fact, I think a lot about in my teaching is just the theoretical frameworks that we think about in the background that might be driving the data generation process. And by that, I really mean in, in sort of layman's terms, or what are the questions we wanna ask? What are the predictions we have in place? What do we expect to see in the data under different types of circumstances? And how can we use our, not just use the data and just use it blindly, but really add the thought that's needed into it to really understand it well, to understand the biases well, to know that we're asking even the right questions that we need and getting the right data that we need for the policy questions that we have. And so, and I, I think this is very important to know that it's not just about, you know, data and data is here and it's dumped in and we just throw it into some model, but really the kind of thought needed to make sure that the data is speaking to the real world and it's speaking to the needs of people. Um, but I think, I, again, I, I, um, I know I'm, I'm supposed to be asking the questions and not giving my own views. So I think, um, I, think um, I, uh, I, I still, I think we've, uh, we're at that point. Um, I think we wanted to do um, a few live audience questions as well right now in, in the few minutes we have left. And so I don't know, Charlotte. Um, yes, thanks so much, Rima. Um, so we're getting a lot of questions about um, building trust in data. And I think we've all touched on this a little bit. Um, but uh, there's kind of an interesting note about um, presidents putting a ban on Twitter. And I feel like that's kind of a hot topic uh, today. Um, and that being kind of um, speaking to a disconnect of trust between tech, citizens, leadership. Um, so I'm not sure if any of you would be able to speak to how to um, cultivate more trust in data and sort of bridge that leadership, public, private sector um, gap in data trust. I could start. Oh, that would be great. I'm sure the other panelists have views as well. <laughs> I think we can probably go at this for about three hours. Um, I just want to say, I, I think, uh, you know, in terms of the government, and, and this is just something I had to worry about when I was an official at the U.S. Treasury Department, um, having kind of really, really sound processes and transparency around kind of data is essential. So, for example, the Treasury Department, um, we, I had colleagues who kind of oversaw the U.S., all the U.S. data from tax forms. And, uh, but, but the very, very strict uh, kind of, but also public process for who could go in and kind of use those data and under what circumstances. And it's in fact restricted to a very small group of researchers that put in applications and those applications get kind of evaluated and they decide within what was within the law. And just kind of just, just to really bring this home, I will say as the assistant secretary of economic policy, I did not have access to the micro data for taxes because I didn't have kind of, I didn't, I didn't have the need uh, and I didn't have the reasons to use it according to what the law said. So, so I think part of it is that um, I should also say, I, I think um, uh, when it comes to government data, I, th I think there's a misunderstanding about kind of, I, I don't think it has to be all or nothing, uh, at least for monitoring the economy. I mean, for some sorts of analyses, you want to have that individual level record, uh, but you could go a long way with um, having kind of just, a, you know, the small group of people who oversees the data, you know, put together 
kind of more granular uh, kind of summary statistics for the economy as a whole than we would normally have. So for example, during the financial crisis, uh, that, that was a period where it was at the Federal Reserve, we were trying to figure out what was going on. And um, we were looking at kind of mortgage debt for the country as a whole. Um, I didn't need to see individual mortgage records to be able to understand that crisis better. I, someone could have just given me uh, you know, what does mortgage debt look like at, you know, in, in the top 5% of the tail? Or, you know, what does it look like, uh, you know, in, 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 in more marginalized communities? Uh, and what does it look like among uh, kind of low income populations? Uh, so, so that would have been just like, you know, 10 times better than what I had access to uh, without giving me access to the microdata itself. Awesome. Do you want to follow up? Because in some sense, your research is very different where the micro data, you know, sometimes when you were thinking at the economy as a whole, the macro data might be useful. But for some of the kind of work that you do, the micro data, for example, if you wanted to understand different types of, you know, put regulations in place on the information a bank could give, um, you know, advertise when they're advertising mortgages and how that affects debt, you might need some more individual data. And so how do you think about trust when you're using individual data? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think uh, trust in the individual, because the act of, at least for that micro data, the, it starts from the act of collection, right? Um, you know, when, when we go and collect data for any use case, um, what is the setting? What is the environment in which that's done? Uh, what is the person told how the data will be used? How is it actually used? Are they, are they getting benefits from that data or not? So it starts almost that, that initial trust starts happening from there. And then I think eventually it does go to what Karen was saying, which it eventually has to lead to kind of changes in, in, in macro, macro policy. I should say, though, increasingly, again, this, you know, this micro and macro divide, both in terms of data, in terms of how we think, is, is, it, is also changing drastically. There was some question about soft data and hard data and things like that. And, you know, is it qualitative and quantitative? You know, all of this is just flipping around now. Like when you do sentiment analysis and social media feeds, what is that? Is that micro data? Is that macro data? Is that soft data? Is that hard data? So I feel like what we're, we're in this beautiful world that a lot of the things that we couldn't do before are feasible now. And we can both do kind of macro policy. So if you want to look at, you know, central bankers care about like, what are people's inflation expectations or what are consumer expectations on purchases? And um, you can imagine now constructing that literally by seeing what people are doing Google searches. on. You know what I mean? Like, and that's like as micro as it gets. So all you need is these nice ways to aggregate uh, these kind of individual data using you know, sensible algorithms or theories about how to do so. So for me, a lot of these worlds are now meeting in a way that I think is actually great for the field and for policy. This is great. And I think I want to turn it over to Matt. And I also, I, I want to pick up on something that both Karen and Asim talked about now. And also you talked about at the beginning that sometimes the data tells you opposite things. Um, sometimes the data tells you one thing now and in two weeks, they'll tell you something different. And how do you think about a leader building trust in the data um, and trust with citizens in the data when you know, data is dynamic? It's not something that's static that we have one piece of information and it's never going to change. How do you think about leadership in that? Yeah, I mean, you know, in, 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 in my experience working in emerging places, that, that should happen a lot. Right, because countries are still working it out. You know, I often I, th I think it's one one of the, one of the funniest experiences I have is when I'm working with a country that'll say we have like a vision 2050 for our economy, and I'll say what is it? And they say no, you know, we're gonna like be like a rich country by then. We're gonna be completely different. And then I say, wow, like how you communicate? And they say no, we have like a series of five year plans. We know exactly how we're gonna do it. And that's what it is. And I'm like, well, you you're creating a problem for yourself because. When you don't deliver on that and you want to change it, you know, you're going to lose your credibility because you're going to learn with evidence that your people don't want those jobs, your people can't do that, your people can do something else, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think there's actually, unfortunately, right ways and wrong ways of doing this. And I think that it is, it, it, it has been interesting to me, the whole movement towards evidence-based policymaking, a lot of people have interpreted as, you know, it's about certain evidence, it's about specific milestones, it's about goals that we have to reach, you know, and you, you bring that together with kind of what we call new public management, which is about this kind of, you know, very rigid approach to, you know, business style management, which really works when we know what we're doing. And I think you, you, people don't realize that what you need to do is develop 
an overall communication mechanism that builds trust in you as the information user uh, as, as, as well as in the information and the evidence. And I think it relates to both what, you know, Asim and Karim were speaking about, about how you collect the data, how you store the data, how you, um, how you, how you protect the data once you have it. All of those things really matter, those procedural things. Um, you know, uh, uh, I think the relationships that you build in those things are more important than anything else. And then I think it needs to be part of a broader communication strategy, right? To me, when I speak about trust, to me, the trust is not the trust in the data. The trust is in the policymakers. The trust is in the leaders. And, um, you know, if a leader is an untrustworthy person, it doesn't really matter how good or if the leadership has proved itself untrustworthy because of whatever reason, it doesn't really matter how good the data is. You know, they, they themselves compromise the trust. And I think the other way is if we agree, you know, with, with Asim that, you know, data is never pure. There's always trust issues with data. Well, then, you know, the data is going to be trusted because of who's using it and because of the fact that people trust you. And they say, we know that the data has gaps, but we know you're trying your best. And I think that um, that is really important. And, you know, sometimes when I, when I, when I, I, I mention this, I say, it's not just about your communication strategy. It's about your communications. And a strategy is something you develop at one point in time. Communications is something you do all the time. And you need to be consistent and you need to be clear and you need to be honest. This is really important with public sector communications. And, and you know, in, in right at the beginning of, of COVID, I, I put a blog out and I said, I see some people have said Q&A, give examples. I think a lot of people know that, you know, I really like the communications of the Prime Minister of Singapore. I really, really like the communications. Have they got everything right? No. But it's precisely because they haven't that I like the communications, because what they do is they say, literally, he sits in a chair and very quietly, he says, here's the data that we have and here's what we know. Here's what we don't know. Here's the decision we're taking, even though we don't know. But here's what we might have to do if we find something out that's different. And he says that at a point in time. And then he comes back after two weeks and he says, here's what we've learned. Here's how we're pivoting. And you can go back and literally Google um, different speeches over periods of time, and you can see those pivots happening. But part of the communication is, I'm going to tell you what we know, then I'm going to tell you what we don't. I'm going to tell you what we're doing to find it out. You're probably going to hear from our data collectors because they're going to come and talk to you as normal people, and you're going to be part of this process. And then when they change and they pivot, they've created the space to do that. Right. And I think that's really important. That's why I say it's not just your communication strategy. It's actually how you communicate, because you can have a strategy that's full of intent, but you can just not do it regularly enough. You cannot do it with the right kind of approach, with the right humility. Again, it gets to this idea that I was speaking about earlier, that an aspect, especially in uncertainty of leadership, involves being vulnerable and it involves being um, open to getting it wrong. And, and, and I think it requires a significant amount of courage. No, thank you, Matt. Unfortunately, I think we've, I would love, love, love to continue this discussion. There's so many things I'd want to add and ask the panelists and also talk about as well. But I think we've run out of time. So I'm going to turn it over to Erica um, to close this out uh, for today. But thank you so much for being here. Um, and I hope to see many of you in the fall.